you know, we were doing Robitussin, you know, which has dextromethorphan in it, which is also a dissociative, which is what ketamine is and also what PCP is. Mm -hmm. But you take enough of it and it just erases your concept of who you are, which is, you know, a form of ego death, right? Mm -hmm. Or it is ego death. People call it ego, ego death. And oftentimes it's terrifying as your ego is dying because your ego wants to survive, right? It's like, it's, like, it's like drowning. It's like, oh, 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 it's like, yeah. oh, I want to live. Oh, okay. You know, and it's trying everything. But then the, the drug is just like dissolving the reference point that is your ego. And so once that's dissolved, you realize, oh shit, ego is a positive thing and there's a healthy ego. But we all have talent. Yes, it's going to be super hard to use those talents if you don't believe in yourself. Oh, 100%. Am I right? <laughs> ego is the awareness of yourself. So you're either going to believe a distortion, you know, that you project that again is based off of kind of a parasitic aspect of yourself. You can kind of compartmentalize yourself and then you start visualizing yourself in a certain way and that starts feeding a darker energy and, and then it starts that picks to win. Up momentum. Yeah, yep, it starts yep. to win. Yeah. And then suddenly you're like, you know, Captain Asshole. It's a fucking riptide, Reggie. Total riptide. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah. like all of a sudden. How boom. the fuck did I get like a football field away from shore? You yeah, know what I mean? Exactly. Which is my real self, my true self. Totally. All right. Welcome, everybody, to another very special episode of Connections Magic. Today we have the man, the myth, the legend, Reggie Watts. <laughs> Hi. Hey, man. Thank you so much for making it. <laughs> oh, man. My pleasure. Yeah. Stoked to get here. Dude, I love this space. This it, is great. Yeah. It's technically kind of home court advantage a little bit. You you know the space. So I do know I the space. I didn't want you to, like, you know, be someplace that you didn't know. It kind of works out. Thanks for doing know, that, man. Yeah. Of course. Makes me, yeah, thanks for the foresight. We were just talking before we started recording about the movie Swingers and the uh, secondhand PTSD that we all felt from the guy leaving the messages on the machine. Yeah, so, it was tough. Yeah, it's really tough. It so. was tough, yeah. I can't, um, let's not dwell on it. I'll, I'll start to feel depressed. <laughs> we're going to move forward from that. But here we go. So I always like to start um, with the guests talking about like the upbringing, right? Where you grew up, because obviously that shapes us, you know? Yeah, 100%. Um, so you are you were very well traveled in your early years, right? You mm -hmm. grew up in, in Germany, Spain, Italy, right? Montana, mm -hmm. and Seattle. Did I get all those right? Yeah, and then Montana was really kind of where I did my main mostly growing up. Okay, cool. So we could dig into like a little more of the the granular experiences, right? Yes. Uh, of growing up in Montana. Yes. Yeah. So there was some, We I, I heard you share that there was a lot of racism in Montana, but it was like kind of like covert, right? It wasn't like out in your face or whatever. And I remember you yeah. sharing about your mom being kind of a gangster and kind of, I don't even remember, oh, showing, yeah. showing up to somebody's house like, you fuck with my kid, I will kill you. Yes, oh, <laughs> yes straight up. Yeah. <laughs> straight up. Can, can you riff a little bit on on that? Just that experience, man, of, of growing up feeling different maybe a little bit in, in Montana? Yeah, I mean, um, it was kind of a strange thing. When I try to remember it, it hmm. mostly fun, you know, hmm. mostly fun. Hmm. Uh, definitely, you know, there was, I think one time a guy chased me in his pickup truck, you know, and they were like trying to shoot me with a BB gun or something like that as a kid. And that sucked. Um, and, you know, and then I was fearful of, like, you know, you'd see, like, images on TV about the Ku Klux Klan, and, you know, and that scared the shit out of me, of course. And um, I think I saw a documentary on it when I was, like, seven or eight or something like that, and that scared the shit out of me. So I had a little bit of that fear, and definitely my mom talked about, you know, me being different, and my my father would, like, mention things about, you know, if people treat you a certain way, yeah. and, like, you know, how to respond and things like that. Um, but most of the time I, I felt... Fine. I always felt like slightly an, an outsider, but most of the time I, I was pretty good at, I was a funny kid, so I endeared people, hopefully, you know, in a, in a... You still got it, by the way, Reggie. Oh, really? <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. So good to know, because I, <laughs> like, I was like, everybody seems to hate me. I don't know why. Um, <laughs> you don't bring a smile to anybody's yeah, face. Like, so I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know what you're talking about, but thanks, man. Thanks for trying. Um, there was a little bit of fear, but most of the time I felt pretty safe. You know, my mom took care of shit. Mm -hmm. She was always actively involved growing up. My dad really didn't, not so much. He was kind of like, you know, went to the Air Force, worked in mm -hmm. the Air Force, and or whatever job he had after he retired, but my mom was really the one that would like come down to the school, would be at the school, would like leave work and come to the school. She was always taking care of me. It was really pretty awesome. I thought it was annoying at the time, like most kids do. Um, but I'm so grateful now because she really protected me, you know, in many, many ways. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah, it's like we don't realize like it's like the cliche thing, like to, you know, say screw you parents. But then, you know, oftentimes 
they know shit, you know? <laughs> yeah, they, yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah, that's, that's what they're supposed to do. And you're supposed to kind of want to get away from them. Yeah. You know, it's like because you're supposed to go out in the world and do your own thing. You're obviously a very gifted musician. And so I want to talk about where did some of the, the music start to form and, and take, take hold in those early years? Like, let's talk about that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I was always interested in music. I listened mm-hmm. to music. Uh, I mean, my parents played a lot of music. They had records and record player. And so they would play James Brown. And my dad listened to a lot of jazz, Cannonball Adderley, you know, all the greats. Um, and my mom loved jazz as well, but she also loved... Uh, uh, you know, kind of, I guess you call it like Euro, like neo folk music or whatever, you know, like Nana Muscuri, uh, who was like, a, I think she was Greek born, but spoke six languages. So she would sing songs in different languages. Yeah. And, um, she was a big fan of Julio Iglesias. And so I, I grew up with a lot of different musical influences mm. all my life. And then I, I loved Ray Charles. <laughs> Okay. As Who was that kid. one artist where it was like, you know, for, for me, it was like Pink Floyd. Like when I first heard Pink Floyd, I was like, holy shit, this is like mind blowing. Like, oh, was that, yeah. Who was that experience? Well, for you? that, you that know? would have come much later, yeah. but that would have probably been, well, the cure in a way. Was uh, that that moment for <clears> you, right? As a kid? Yeah. Yeah. It was one, it was mm-hmm. one of them. Like when mm-hmm. I saw them, I was like, what is happening right now? Cause it was the first thing I was on 120 minutes. Yeah. Forgot who the host was at that time. Cause there was a Matt, Matt Penfield maybe, but, um, yeah, the rocker guy off MTV. Yeah. No? Right. Yeah. So, which I think started in like 1987, 1988. And I used mm-hmm. to, every Sunday night it would be on for two hours and I would watch, you know, uh, religiously. And I remember seeing, uh, just like heaven, the video for just mm, like heaven come yeah, on. That's the jam. And I was like, yeah. totally, I felt totally transformed. Yeah. And as I, as you're saying that, like, like that's like John Hughes vibes. And I remember you oh, like yeah. having an affinity for like John Hughes, you said at some point, oh, right? Yeah. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, I, I think the first John Hughes movie, like most people was, um, 16 candles and that, that influenced me. And then that, that was all kinds of music was in that. Cause he had good, good, great taste. Totally, in Totally dude. Those soundtracks you know? were like, <clears throat> Epic, epic, yeah. epic, totally. Like having a bit of nostalgia because, like, I'm an '80s kid. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. I'm just like, man, what if you juxtapose like that era with today's era? Like, it's like unrecognizable, it, right? It's like it's just, <sighs> it's it's weird. Yeah. You know, it's a funny thing because, like, oftentimes I'll be like, oh man, you know, I wish my friends, my younger friends, like, um, I wish they would have gotten experience what I got to experience. You know, because it was simpler, a lot simpler back then. And now, yeah. now I sound like an old person, but uh, it definitely was a lot simpler. Because I know. We're making ourselves sound washed I right know. now, but we're not washed, uh, No, dude. no, we're not. <laughs> not at all. Uh, but, but, uh, so when it's 2000, We don't want to see the comments, bro. We don't, <laughs> yeah, don't let like, up the no, comment section. No nags. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, it's like you, you heard, you heard music on the radio and you heard music in movies and TV Yeah, and that's kind of it. And then you went down to the music store, you know, yeah. or you subscribed to a music trade publication or you got Rolling Stone or, you yeah. know, or Cream or whatever. But, um, and if you wanted to write a letter to somebody, you literally had to physically write a fucking letter and out. And you could. And it meant, think about how much more that means, bro. Think about the effort, right? It's oh, just totally. like, man, you know, I remember, yeah, I had pen pal, you know, back, but I don't Same. remember who they were, but I remember having one, but yeah, I mean, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, the discovery back then was, uh, you know, friends, yeah. people talking, yeah. radio, all that stuff. But on the radio, there was such great music. It's like nowadays, if there was a radio station, I'd be like, Ugh. you know, I'd be like, <laughs> It's like seventy percent of it is just like, nah, yeah. Okay, well, you tried, you know that type of thing, um, and then the rest of it, it's just like a lot of factory music, it, you know, just like the same shit over yeah. and over again with different singers, you know, like dressed differently. Dude, it, to me, <clears throat> it, it became more about packaging than substance. Totally. Back in the day, it was more substance than packaging. Way, yeah. way more. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like people yeah. projected an image, and yeah. obviously it was show yeah. business, yeah. but. No, but it was a it was a whole list. You actually had to be in most cases, and obviously people can find tons of cases of like kind of vapid, you yes, know, like yeah. kind of whatever throwaway shit. Uh, and there were there were like one hit wonders. And all but it stuff. wasn't the majority, Reggie. No, right? It was not. Yeah, yeah. No, because yeah. when you listen to like you know, I listen to Top Forty, yeah. you know, Rick D's, and yeah. you know, whoever else was was doing shit like that. It was all like you know, you get like a song by Earth, Wind, and Fire, and uh-huh. you get like Phil Collins and Philip Bailey doing a duo together, and then you get like fucking um, Aerosmith doing mm-hmm. a you know duet with Run DMC. And hip hop was a new thing back then. Yeah, you know, break dancing, all that stuff. So there was so much cultural like awakening happening, in, especially in the early '80s and punk and post punk. You know, we've had guests. We'll have, we'll have guests mm-hmm. on the show yeah. all the time. Late late show. I'm not gonna name names, but like he'll get like these like soft vocal 
like, you know, with guitar and like, you know, three chord changes over and over again or piano, you know, pick a pick thing. And they were like running a track on a laptop yeah. and they're dressed crazy. But you close your eyes and it's just the it could be 30 of the artists we've had on there. Like you close your oh, eyes, you're like, it's the same, it's the same thing yeah, over and over yeah, and over again. Yeah. And I'm happy that they're making a living, you know, and that they get to tour and all that stuff. But yeah. like once in a while we'll get someone that just actually blows me away. And I'm like, oh, right, hope. Okay, great. <laughs> you know? I mean, dude, it's like it's like finding like a canteen in the desert sometimes. Sometimes. Bro. Like, you know what I mean? I, I think, you know. And the internet <clears throat> actually, it's like, it's kind of this weird paradox where Anybody can get theoretically discovered, but it's so fucking saturated. Yes. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, at the end of the day, to me, it's almost a wash in some ways. There was a cool uh, Prince bar that I wanted to reference, oh. actually. He said, you know, and we were talking about John Hughes in the 80s and a more like kind of yeah. like, you know, bucolic time or whatever yeah, yeah. like that. And he was like saying, um, uh, let's see, let me recall the bar, but it was like, we used to escape life back in the day and go into the internet. Now we escape the internet and go into life i love it because yeah. it's, it's very true today yeah like even yeah. in gen z you know like you're, mm -hmm. there's like reports that a lot of gen z are kind of turning tuning out like they're turning they're, oh really they're, they're not responding they're, they're not okay as yeah. much in the internet way interesting um and that's why that you know like the red wave or whatever and like they, they were surprised by yeah. gen z voters because oh. they weren't they weren't actively involving themselves in um polls and polling mm. and stuff like that they or they would give false answers interesting and um or they just wouldn't participate so and yeah. then, then then they just voted no one had a clue how that was going to go and then they just kind of like no we're going to do this you know i'm sure people will refute it but i think that they're kind of becoming a little bit more organic mm-hmm central mm -hmm. they're valuing mm -hmm. organic connection hey guys just want to take a minute and say thank you so much for watching this video i really hope you're appreciating the content and that you are being uplifted and inspired please hit the subscribe button if you've not done so already we've got so many more cool guests powerful interviews just raw truth being shared to uplift and inspire humanity if you have not done so already please follow the podcast on spotify and apple podcasts mean the world to us as we continue to grow this channel and this platform to continue to spread positivity in a world that really is hurting right now thank you so much for your support it means the world god bless and now you're a big technology guy i know right you know yes. i was listening to some interviews bro. like how what language is this guy talking right now but like you know there's uh i think I think it's called Neuralink. Neuralink with Neuralink. Like it's, all, right, all right, so Elon yeah, Musk yeah. is trying yeah. to, and I'm like, we're <clears throat> moving towards merging, you know, human beings and like AI. I feel like, and some, it's, I mean, it, there's people that want to do that. I think Elon might be one of them. Yeah. How do you feel about that being like a huge, you know, technology advocate? Mm. I'm, I'm wondering, you know, honestly, because I feel like you have both. You also like the human side of. Mm. And yeah. yeah, you mean like Neuralink specifically? Yeah, or just well, like just the, the idea maybe of like one day, like we have a chip in us and oh. you, like, you know. Yeah, like, I mean, it's... my feeling on that is uh, I think I think it's a little bit misguided um, and I think it's unnecessary. The problem with like mm -hmm. combining, like fusing um, electronic computational hardware to the human system sucks because as we know, iPhone comes out and it's... <laughs> irrelevant like nine months later so you're putting gear into your body that's probably going to improve like in just a matter of months so why even do that so i think i think it's smarter to do non-invasive technology technology that reads uh human thought through uh brainwave patterns electromagnetic whatever uh patterns or things that just observe us visually mm -hmm. um or biometrics you know we can wear stuff that like says a lot gives us a lot of data yeah. um that you know artificial intelligence can aggregate and like can interpret. And, and so I don't think that there's, I think it's a bad idea unless it's someone who needs to, who is having a problem with speech or yeah, someone who's having yeah. motor, motor neuron functions and stuff like that. Then I can see the technology of something like Neuralink, um, or anything associated like that, I think that that can be very helpful, you know, like a bridging, like damaged nerves, you know, by bypassing it with electronics, totally down for that to increase the quality of someone's life. But as an elective, technology i just don't i think it's unnecessary and i think it's it's kind of a waste of money uh, for that i think they should still continue to research for, for medical reasons but i don't think for like everyday use we don't need to do that yeah that's a good point because I, I feel like all tech just kind of like updates so quickly yeah. right it's like wouldn't that suck yeah, you're like doing? you got the latest blah 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 you'd be like cool and then like someone two years like a more powerful process you're like fuck sorry, sorry. elon sorry yeah. <laughs> sorry elon yeah go away elon you'll make the world a better place that's awesome <laughs> by the way Amazing, 
amazing shirt. That's actually literally sick. on my sheet of questions. Oh, sick. It awesome. says, ask me right. about my K-hole. <laughs> We're going to get there in just a second, Reggie. Yeah. But um, I wanted to sort of kick it back to, you know, we're talking about we we're talking about music there for a little while, right? Mm -hmm. So for the struggling musician today, right? Um, I feel like there's a lot of creatives on the come up that like listen to the show, to be honest. Yeah. So like, do you have any wisdom as a guy that's kind of, you know, crossed the chasm and found a way to do it, you know, in a more stable, sustainable way? <laughs> like, is there, it, did you, did you struggle? I interviewed a guy named Joey Warnaker. Do you know him? Oh yeah. yeah, amazing yeah. He's drummer. amazing. He's incredible. Yeah, dude. I feel like all the doors flow. In, in fact, um, we sat down and why I wanted to have him on the show was he's like, I never really struggled. Like all the, you know, he just was like, cause the yeah. show was about overcoming struggles. Right, like, right, right. I mean, I definitely had struggles in that. Uh, yeah, I never, I never like questioned. I never felt like I had a struggle necessarily with my ability. Uh, I feel like I had enough training as a kid, um, studying classical piano and violin. Like I had enough musical training and I was pretty good at it. You know, I took to it naturally and that felt good. I definitely like, you know, stopped at a certain, growing at a certain point with like music theory and things like that. But I have like a base, you know, a basis of music theory, which still serves me to, 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 till today. But, uh, you know, I definitely struggled financially, you know. So many talented musicians that it's like what, you know, one super talented musician to making it to one that doesn't make it. What do you think those X factors might be? Yeah, I think you know? I, I think it's like, you know, you, you well, you have your talent, you have your ability and, yeah. and you have your hopefully the belief in yourself that uh, you you need to be doing this. You know, like you just kind of wake up and you need to be doing it. And it's kind of easy. That part's the easy part. Like if you just want to do it and you want to be involved in whatever scene you want to be, whether it's dance or music or whatever, um, you just have that impulse and that compulsion. So that's what drives you. And then, then the rest of it is just kind of social, you know, being social and being involved in a scene and, you know, hanging out and putting out the effort and putting yourself out there. I remember you said you know? in, when in Seattle, when the grunge scene was taking off, you yeah. said you saw people playing on stage that like blew your mind. And you're yes. like, one day maybe I could play with them or something. Did you kind of visualize yeah. that for yourself? And yeah. Oh, a hundred percent. Yeah. Well, yeah, because, you know, I, I was always curious and very social and wanted to, you know, know what the fuck was going on, yeah. you know, in town and like, what was, what was this, what was that? So I was in a shit ton of bands and I was in a lot of bands, you know, because I, Wanted to be, but I also needed to make mu uh, money, you know, and so, yeah, so it was like a, I just worked really hard, you know, to, to, to make rent. But luckily, I mean, also my mom provided rent, you know, yeah. once in a while when I was low and my parents, or my parents did, my dad and mom. And, um, you know, and then I went to school and, you know, they took out a loan and, you know, and I got, I got to chill out on working and just go to school for a while. But I was always playing and always working hard um, all throughout that time. And I felt like there definitely were struggles where I was like, am I going to make rent? You know, am I am going to fucking make rent or not? You that know? vibe, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But, um, yeah, but, yeah, and I, yeah, I guess I just never, and I, I, I always knew that I was going to be doing what I was doing. But You never had any doubts that you would kind of make there was, it to the other side, let's there, say. Where, well, you know. there was a moment, there was a moment, like, after my band kind of almost got signed a bunch of times, you know. Yeah, um, talk to us about that, Reggie. Um, well, yeah. the, the, uh, the, my band Mock Tube, which was my original project in... Shout out The Alchemist, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, The Alchemist, uh, Paolo, Paolo uh -huh. Coelho, yeah. Coelho, Coelho, no, Coelho, Coelho, pa Paolo Coelho. Coelho, Coelho, yeah. Coelho doesn't matter. <laughs> Mila, Camila Cabello. <laughs> Anyways, um... Yeah, so th there was this original band I was in, but we were kind of like a hybrid band, so we were mm -hmm. kind of hard to classify. And at that time, the music industry was very on being very uncertain, and um, for for no one knew where it was going. Was this like after Napster hit? Or it's around what, that time, right? yeah, 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 it was like yeah. mid '90s, uh -huh. you know, mid to late '90s. Yeah, and yeah, everything was changing, and they were, you know, they were looking for specific types of artists and people who were big at the time, like you know, Tori Amos's and. Um, Limp Biscuit, yeah, Limp Biscuit, yeah, <laughs> for real. Uh, you know, Jill Hurst. Scott and those, you know, those people, the Roots. Yeah, there was a lot of amazing stuff, or trip hop and acid jazz and all the electronic stuff. Yeah, and we were kind of influenced by all that stuff, so we we hybridized all of it, including rock and grunge and stuff like that. So I, we were hard to pin down, and so we we had a lot of close calls with labels coming flying, people flying out, president label presidents flying out to mm -hmm. come to see us play, and you know, 
they're just not taken. And, and kind of like this, right? Up, down, yeah. and that, yeah, that, that, that can be hard to ride out, honestly. Yeah. And so. It is. Yeah. It is really hard. Mm -hmm. But there was, you know, there was a moment where we'd been doing it a while and I started getting back into comedy, doing some sketch comedy and was doing like some comedy at like, you know, bar nights and stuff like that. And mm -hmm. started falling back in love with just making weird, dumbass videos and, and things like that. And, mm. and it was, it was, it was great, but, but. You know, there was a moment where I had to question, like, where am I going? I don't know. That, I don't know if this band is going to make it. You know, I mean, everybody in the band is super talented. And they're all, like, amazing people. And I spent so many years with them. And, um, but there just came a moment where I was like, I don't know if it's going to get any better. I don't know if something's going to happen. That's when I kind of started doubting or questioning what I should do. But then comedy started, I started taking a liking to comedy. And then that kind of unveiled itself. And that was my next step. So it almost feels like you drew some creative inspiration from there to get you kind of out of your head about, is this going to happen? And you, you kind of just found your flow, I guess. Yeah. You know, not to sound no, no. cheesy, but yeah. No, 100%. Mm -hmm. That's exactly mm -hmm. what happened. Yeah. Nice. The Late Show, like, how did that come about? Because, you know, how long have you been doing The Late Show for now? So, yeah, that was like, that was weird because I was doing comedy Bang Bang, mm -hmm. um, which was kind of like a fake talk show. And I left that you know, you know comedy bang bang well okay yeah. all right okay <laughs> yep and uh scott ackerman and his whole team they're mm -hmm. so brilliant um and it was an honor to be a part of that for sure but there came a point where i was kind of tired of you know the, the filming schedule and i was just kind of getting a little bit bothered and annoyed and i didn't i didn't like that you know just like getting yeah. up early and kind of waiting around a lot and you know there's a lot of because it's very run and gun in, yeah. a, in a way and it was yeah. you know heavily guest based so we had to like work around the schedules and all mm -hmm. that stuff so schedules were constantly shifting and changing uh and it was you know a very challenging show I'm, i mean i wasn't like running it or anything like that but i imagine that was even more stressful but for me uh, for what i do i just like to have a good time and if i'm not start to not have a good time doing something i don't want to i start to get grumpy and i don't want to be grumpy wow. i want to have a good time the only reason i'm doing this is to have a good time so so i left and then like before i was going to go back to new york my manager at the time told me that this guy james corden wanted to meet me and so i met him at a hotel um, with his showrunner at the time, uh, well, still showrunner, Ben mm -hmm. Winston. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, and he just kind of broke down what the show is, what he was looking for. He's looking for a band leader. He's taken over the, um, uh, what's his name, Ferguson's spot. Um, and, that you know, the Late Late Show was looking for, you know, someone like me. And I guess that James had an eye on me from the start. Like, mm. I guess he really wanted me to be on that. Someone told me recently that they were around him. That's cool to have. Saying like, that, that's all he, he just wanted me. There was wow. nobody. He was, he was like, I'm going to get this guy. That's amazing. No matter what. Love that. So, um, yeah. So then I joined, I joined the Late Late Show in mm. 2014. Damn. And, and um, that's what made me move to, to LA. Okay. Prior to that, you were a New York guy, New York. right? Yeah, yeah. 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 You got the New York vibe a little bit. Yeah. And New York. <laughs> and fucking so, New York. So, let's, dovetail those two points I was trying to make together the, you're ending that sh that show's ending what does that feel like for you I remember you said you might have to you might have to drop a couple of cars you said yeah, or something yeah I, yeah, I might have to <laughs> you might have to sell one of my cars I hope I can hold on to at least one um but um yeah I mean it, I you know I'm worried you know I'm definitely worried about like what's my next thing will I have a job you know but um you know I have some things that are how do you deal good. with that you, you, are there other people you talk to or like you, you are you able to like kind of self-coach yourself a little bit through that stuff or, well you know? my my agent um Rachel Rush at CAA I've been with her for a really long time yeah. and uh I really love her mm -hmm. and I love my whole team actually there's nobody I'm I, everybody on my team is rock solid my manager Kara is insanely great um yeah, so I have no, I think my team is great. And then Rachel Rush was kind of reassured, reassured me at one point. I was like, oh, I'm going to have to get rid of my car. She's like, you're not going to, you're not going to have to sell your cars. <laughs> awesome. and, and it's a dumb. Everybody needs a manager like it, this. It's a, it's, a, it's a dumb thing to like fix it. But for me, the yeah. cars and the house that I live in, that I'm renting, if I can hold on to those. That's all I care about because I don't have kids. I'm not yeah. married. I'm not yeah. planning on having kids yeah. and low overhead. So I'm hoping, you know, and I definitely was spending like a fool, you know, for the last few years or whatever, just like, you know, buying my friends keyboards and like in, taking a cool vacation or like, you know, giving my friend a free trip somewhere or whatever, or like having, a, you know, fixing my friend's cars or like giving mm. them solar tenting so they don't burn their arms when they're driving, you know, that kind of shit. So a lot of like spending and my money managers like, you got to so chill out because the job's ending. So now I'm in kind of a safe mode but i am a little like uh, i hope i don't uh, am i gonna be uh you know but 
ultimately, I have a bunch of things that I'm pitching, and I think that I've got some really great partners involved. So nice. I th- I'm not ultimately hopeful. Okay, Reggie's gonna be okay, man. <laughs> Here's, here's the, but I heard a story about uh, George. You mentioned team there, and I'm sure you've had, you know, over the years, you've had uh, a lot of different people probably help you, right, over the years, because you've been yeah. in entertainment for a long time, right? So Yeah, yeah. I, you know, not as many as you'd think. I've oh, actually been okay. with this current, in current my booking oh. agent I've been with, like, for four, I want to say, like, 12 years or something like that. That's a, that's a long run. Yeah, yeah, yeah I mean, yeah, there's yeah. a lot okay. of people that All I've right. been with for a very long time. Okay, usually, am I right <laughs> that usually that, it can change up a lot. A lot People's of turnovers. Teams. Yeah, yeah. I just yeah, got yeah, lucky. I mean, good. Andrew Skickney um, at UTA is my booking, my live booking agent, mm-hmm. and he's f- fucking fantastic. Like I've always, he used to he used to pick me up at the airport when I was coming into town, like to do Not, gigs oh, and dude, stuff that's like that. Rad. He'd give okay. me rides. That's right. You know what I mean? Like that's he's rad. he was just awesome. Can I tell you what uh, where I wanted to go with that? Yeah, though? yeah, yeah. All right, so like so George <clears throat> Clooney, like when he was coming up and he was broke for a while and yeah. all that like when he like made it yeah he uh he had like 14 people that he felt like were really kind of bolstered him during those rough days and he gifted each one of them a million dollars cash did you hear the story oh no yeah no, yeah, yeah. No. that's pretty rad that is it, like, classy as fuck <laughs> Pretty that's, amazing, that's right? And I'm like, because we it takes, dude, it takes a village sometimes when we're trying to find our way, dude. Like I have, I have friends like that that like have bolstered me. You know what I mean? Like, do you? Does yeah. anything come to mind like this for you? Because you're like, I buy friends trips and stuff like that. I mean, yeah. Do you? Do you have some people that bolstered you um, yeah, in that way? Yeah, I mean, it sounds like your mom was one of those people for sure. Uh, right? Mom, yeah, mom, one hundred percent. Mom and dad, you know, um, for sure, a hundred percent. You know, my first manager, well, I mean, technically my first manager, David Miner, he was more like a band guy, and so he managed my bands in Seattle, and kind of managed me for a little bit when I was in New York, but um, he just wasn't, he's not a comedy guy. So, yeah. But then I ran into uh, Olivia Wingate, who is now a producer, um, but she was a fantastic, well, she was my agent first. She was a booking agent for yeah. Europe, so she got me to Edinburgh, and uh, me and Eugene Merman, actually, who voices Eugene's voice in Bob's Burgers. Oh, cool. cool, cool. Um, and uh, so she brought both of us over to Edinburgh, and I did three years in a row, So, mm-hmm. and she was just a hustler, man. She, mm-hmm. I really owe a lot to her. She, Olivia Wingate, really... She got you some momentum, Man, basically, right? Tons of momentum. She set up so much cool stuff. She got good deals going. She was really smart. She hooked me up with my current assistant that oh, I've nice. been with for 14 years. Yeah, shout out Jamie. Jamie. Okay. Jamie Andrews. There you go. I don't know where I'd be without Jamie. She's uh, So Jamie is definitely someone I would count. She yeah. takes care of so many incredible things in my life, and I feel like I've I've got she's got my back, and uh, she's great. And, you know, and so that was Olivia. That was her. Um Rachel Rush back in the day was like working at, I think she was a producer or something. And I couldn't quite understand, but I think she was a producer and worked or a junior agent or something that worked at, uh, uh, at Montreal uh, comedy festival yeah. just for laughs. And that's where I met her. And I just mm-hmm. thought she was the cool, we got along so well. She was so mm-hmm. cool. And, uh, so her, I mean, Eugene Merman, um, you know, Bobby Tisdale, um, Sarah Silverman really uh, boosted me a lot. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Uh, God, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Uh, the the writer that got me onto the Fallon show when it was in New York before he got the Tonight Show, mm. um, uh, Todd Todd Levin. He, he was the one who suggested me to be on that show, and so Todd helped me out. Um, there was a lot of people There's that like, people. took took to me yeah. and like saw what I was doing. Or Conan even, you know, like oh yeah, Conan, because you've done a lot of stuff with Conan. Yeah, you know, Kristen Shaw. Mm-hmm. Without Kristen Shaw urging me to take do the Andy Kaufman Award, I wouldn't have won the Andy Kaufman Award. Yeah. I wouldn't have met Andy's dad, you know, and had, he heard yeah. stories directly from Andy's dad. I wouldn't have. Um, you know, I, I, there's just like so many in the comedy community that we all helped each other, I will say. But yeah. um, those people with Conan helped a lot. Conan let me do whatever the fuck I wanted to do on that tour and yeah. took a chance on me. And that really take, helped a lot. It takes know. a village, man. I mean, it's just it really does. reiterating yeah. that point. And, yeah, and then but, all my new, my, all my my team, obviously, now. So. so the other thing I've noticed just working around a lot of creatives um, is like, people can sabotage themselves. Have you seen that happen before? Do you have friends that it doesn't seem like you've done oh, that? Yeah. Cause you know, but you, what is it like to watch somebody sabotage themselves? And do you have any wisdom that you could like share with the listeners on maybe 
how to be aware of that. that. <laughs> right. I mean, yeah. How, how to not do that. Um, and cut. Start, yeah, <laughs> start by not doing that. Um, but, no, I mean. But why, where do you think it comes from? And like, like I'd like to dig into that a little bit because it's, it's common. Yeah, I, I, think, I think a lot of it, I think it comes from insecurity. There's an instability and an insecurity and an uncertainty. And so there's fear ultimately. Mm -hmm. And so they start responding to fear by like using easy to go to solutions, which could be drugs. It mm -hmm. could be um externalizing your anger on on other people and like being you know being frust frustrated within yourself and then like projecting that on the channeling people. that yeah, yeah and yeah, directing yeah. it and at then, people and then you're just pushing people away yeah, and you're pushing burning people bridges away. right yeah yeah and you're just kind of getting into your own echo chamber um mm -hmm. you know and these you know i've seen it happen with a few friends you know and not naming names but like my you know my hope is that like just rectify rectify the situation within yourself to do the work you know to like mm -hmm. figure out what the fuck is going on and why did mm -hmm. how did you how did you how did you create a parasitic version of yourself that conned you into doing some shit that derails you cuz well it's all, it's cuz it's, well it's, it's all you it's like there's no one on the outside that ultimately these people have everything afforded to them they they had like a, a modicum of success yeah um people like them they're on a path and then they're just like they just go off the rails cuz they start they start that feedback loop. They get in that feedback loop. But really, it's just like going in yourself, analyzing what the fuck is going on, humility, and make sincere apologies and just yeah. be a better person. And people love to forgive people. Like they people, do. People don't really understand that. But, like, you could, like, you could fuck up somebody in some way or be hurtful to somebody, obviously, aside from, like, killing their family yeah. or something like that. But, <laughs> but like, um, you know, you can be hurtful to somebody, but when someone's sincere and they come at you personally face to face and that humanity is oh kind of hard because because i think they recognize yeah. they've done that to somebody or they've been you know what i mean we're all human yeah so, we're right, all right, human right, right, right. people okay. people love yeah. to forgive I and mean, some people are like it's hard for them to forgive but yeah. most people if they're hit at the right angle and yeah. it's sincere they want to forgive people oh that's perfect because they want their life to feel they don't want that burden anymore like yeah. why, why do you want to be hanging on to like some, some memory of some asshole that like awesome. that burns you every time you think they, their name you know someone mentions their name or you think about them and you're like one of my favorite Argh. quotes is hate hurts the hater more than the hated a hundred percent a hundred percent and you know people can either fall for it you know because they're insecure too and they think that directed yeah. animus is true about them or they've got enough resilience where they're like man are you okay mm -hmm. is the mm -hmm. response are you okay yeah it's like, you just fucking like... fuck whatever piece of shit and you're just like are you okay <laughs> that's awesome you know what i that's mean funny. instead of like well fuck you you know back or whatever because that's yeah. what they want because yeah. like the parasite wants to be reinforced yeah so that's yeah. funny i remember russell brand was saying like you know, if you see a dude in like a, a yellow shiny ferrari you gotta go, come up to be like are you okay like sometimes because a lot of people are compensating of course. sometimes, right? So, you know. Of course. So but, you know, yeah. also the great way yeah. to compensate is like, <laughs> it's just like, I, I, if I see like some dude like, Ugh, you know, like, and they're kind of being whatever. Yeah. And, you know, and they're like in some whatever car yeah, that they're mean? trying, I'll be like, I'll just compliment the car. Uh -huh. You know, I'll be like, I'll get into a conversation about the car and I'll be like, because like, obviously they chose it for a reason. I mean, you see them like they happen to be wearing like a cool pair of shoes or sure. whatever. You like make an entrance that way and it disarms them because everybody's a fucking nerd and you just got to find that nerd point. You know, mm -hmm. like you're like, oh, you're obviously love these types of coats or you obviously yeah. love hanging out in these types of venues or ask them like why do you like hanging out here yeah um, you know i noticed that you were doing this like even though they it could be like a, a not a very good person or a terrible person but there's always a way in and that's why i've, I've hung out with you know people that have terrible reputations wow. but i have a way of you know hopefully not always not always successful but i have a way of getting in there and just kind of like going i'm going to address you as a human being and i'm going to ask you some questions and hopefully that'll open up you open you up and Maybe, maybe it might help, you know, maybe loosen up something, have a little bit of self-realization. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, for sure. I can't make anybody do anything, but. Um, also, I had, you know, like Tyler Creator's manager was on here once and he knows the whole story of Tyler's buildup. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and he was <laughs> like, you know, Tyler got a lot of hate early on. I don't know if you're aware of that, but he kind of used the hate as fuel yeah. To like, I don't know if you're aware of this, but he likes, I didn't to, know quote, that, yeah. he likes to quote retweet people that are like, you'll never win a Grammy. He like loves of course. nothing more than going back and being like, hi, bitch, I got my Grammy. Yeah, 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 yeah. What are your, th and, and me, I'm, I think I'm, I'm a very like loving kind of kinder person where I'm like, I don't want to feed on hate. Like no, that, no. that seems like a horrible Fuck fuel that. source for me. And I'd rather just kind of keep it positive. Yeah. But where, where are you in that? Like, do you just ignore the hate and just kind of keep it moving? And, and, no, and what are your thoughts? No, I, I love it. I usually. 
usually respond. To, I usually re, I usually respond to like you know because like uh, even like last night, like yesterday's show in the news monologue sec- section that um, James does from the desk. You know, he was talking about this bar owner in Australia that will not play Mariah Mariah Carey's Christmas song, um, "All I Want for Christmas" or whatever that yeah, is. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and I was like, yeah, yes, you know. And my guitar player was like, yes. And we were like, yeah, because oh, we're, you guys we're like, do not, we're you like, guys oh, we're that over. Yeah, like yeah, that yeah, song yeah. is like played six gazillion yeah, times, true. and it was great. It's a great, it's a great song. Yeah, and I'm happy for Mariah. It's her, <laughs> it's her 401k. I heard some comedian say she will never have to give up a car or a house. No, Thank you to that. Song. Will, no, to that song. <laughs> right, yeah. That song is like right. congratulations, you hit the jackpot. <laughs> it's a great song, but when yeah. you hear it all the fucking time, it's like I yeah. understand why he doesn't want to hear it. So we were just like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we're all like Gen Xers, so we're like into like being like a little bit assholeish in that way. Yeah. But um, and uh, and then someone wrote like they just said some shit like they said like we were like called us pigs and like okay. you know and said like you know you low level you know hogs or whatever and the ancient clown behind me and all this stuff. And then I just kind of responded. Well, actually, I'll read the response. It's like <laughs> you tell them oink oink. Um, <laughs> you know there are more constructive ways for you to express and transmute your inner turmoil. Oh. Question mark. Uh, I understand projecting negativity intended to inflict harm on others seems like a fast solution to self satisfaction, but it's ineffective and hollow at best. That's how I responded. Damn, that's mic drop worthy. <laughs> that's amazing, Reggie. But I, but I, I love responding so... that way because like it gives them an opportunity, yeah, to go like, oh fuck, maybe what I said. It almost feels like what harsh. you said a minute ago <clears throat> about the way in <clears throat> to like quote unquote maybe people with horrible personalities or whatever and like yeah. you'll find that one common denominator as an entry point totally 100 percent. got it yeah it's 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 i i get off on it and sometimes it, you know i get a little bit over adrenalized you know with it yeah. i'm just like trying to like answer so, everyone you know because i love i don't like people getting away with these like casual like well, you're a piece of shit huh. or you fuck and then i and then i'm always like i'll either do like a hyper negative so i'll like take that and i'll make i'll go even further and i'll be like i am a piece of shit i, I don't really have any value at all and you roll I really with that. suck okay um, and suck you're completely right and i'm sorry i'm gonna try to do better you know or something I. like that e. like yeah and, james and, blunt you know yeah. james you know james blunt james blunt was like you, you thought 2020 was bad i'm releasing an album in 2021 or oh. something oh, james yeah, blunt yeah, yeah, used yeah. to like you know, like rip on himself. Yes, right, which, right, right. So I don't know. That's what it's, I thought of when you said that. It's kind of like, like it's, it's, a, it's it. a preemptive, like I out negative them. So they have nowhere to go. People like that cannot win against creativity and compassion. There's no way they can win. Like if I got into an argument, so I've been trying to pick fights with Elon Musk online because I just think he's a fucking dick um, and he needs help. But uh, I've been trying to pick arguments, you know, um, with him. Okay, I don't think he's ever going to respond, he, okay. but I look forward to having discussions like what that. What was a him. recent thing you said to Elon? Do you mind sharing with uh, us? Can I think he did that one? pronoun. Remember that pronouns thing? He's like, my pronouns are prosecute. Fauci yes, 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 yes. What did you say I, to that? I said that incorrect. Those are not pronouns. <laughs> but you'll figure yourself out someday. Hmm. And, uh, and, huh. and because, like, I, I really relish getting in, like, discussions with people like that because I, I'm i pretty sure, and it's it feels like maybe over self-confidence, but I'm pretty sure they will not be. It's like, Reg- well, for instance, yeah. <laughs> uh, Sarah Silverman did TED did a stand up set uh, at at Ted proper in long long when it was in Long Beach and her set offended uh some people in the audience and you know cuz it's like a worldly audience and so it offended some people in the audience then the dude who ran Ted uh kind of passively aggressively like on Twitter or whatever said like he was sorry he was apologizing for her for her set, you know, like, oh, you not know. defending her, but <clears throat> no, right, right, no, right. no, just okay. saying like we're yeah. very sorry that it offended or whatever, and then got into this Twitter battle with Sarah. You're not going to win because she's so no, creative. You're saying, yeah, because she's right, so right, creative yeah, yeah, and yeah. she's so laser focused and yeah. she's like very good. She's sensitive to inequity and people being unfair and to to other people and bullying mm-hmm. and pressuring. She doesn't stand for it. Mm-hmm. And I'm the same way. My mother is the same way. She's a egalitarian, you know, French French yeah. woman, very fiery. She doesn't stand for it. And I'm like, uh. I will not stand for people picking on other people, whether it's, uh, you know, whether it's Dave Chappelle, you know, talking about trans people yeah. or whatever. It's like, do better. Speak truth to power. Don't fucking pick on people who are like less than 0.006% of the population. It's like, fuck you for doing that. Like you deserve like all of that reflection that you put that you that you put out, you need that reflected back on you. Yeah. So you can so you can feel that. But but also an out is just have fun and 
do better. Mm. Like that's the good part. I'm never like I don't write anybody off. I'm just like it's you know, not hold coming yourself accountable. from a low vibration with you, man. It's not like no. you know you're not. It's like you're really even when you say something like um that butterfly twenty five. Yeah, yeah, shout out butterfly twenty. Yeah, uh, <laughs> the way you came at them was like do better. It was like almost like from a humanitarian place. Like yeah. you know you're better than this and yeah. Yeah, yeah, but a lot of people like try and go kind of vitriolic, I think, sometimes and not do that. They the, don't want to see them do well. They want to see them burn yeah. at stake. Does yeah. that make sense? You know? Totally. They want yeah, yeah, they yeah. want a total cesspool. Yeah. I mean, I posted this thing yeah. that I, I forget his name. Uh, I posted on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, look look at Reggie Watts, unless I've been shadow banned. But, um, <laughs> but uh, if you look at the tweet I posted, uh, I think it's like Brian O'Connor. Con, I, I can't remember, but he's like this uh, talk show, video talk show yeah. guy that has like a, talk, a call-in show in Britain. He's so succinct and so awesome. And he does this really great expose on on, on Elon yeah. and what he's doing with Twitter. And it's just spot on. Mm -hmm. But the way he does is, is he just, he systematically deconstructs all the shit that he's saying. And then he's like, assumes like why he's doing what he's doing. And then he just kind of arrives at this conclusion that is very pragmatic and logical but if elon were to see it perhaps i well if elon were to see it there's n for, first of all there's nothing he could do to combat what he mm. lays out there's nothing he, he would not even come close to looking good at all talking to this guy if he's going to be combat if he wants to actually work through his shit which i think would be great if imagine if elon made a, a 180 and was just like we oh, love to forgive people oh yeah we love to forgive people and he's like you know what i'm selling twitter back to someone who knows what the yeah. fuck they're doing i'm going to stop using this as my personal like troll you know yep. um amplification he just farm. seems like a kid having a temper tantrum yeah really. he's a, i mean he, that's just how he's, an, he's a little boy he's yeah, a, he's a nine-year little feels. boy and i feel for him you know he's on the spectrum and he's like surrounded he's in an echo chamber he's got yeah. so much power and attention and people falsely put him on a on a on a pedestal yeah. and he's conned his way into the the mainstream and he's done some great things of course like yeah. i'm so happy for the electric car i was a huge fan for sure for many many years yeah many years i was like oh man this dude oh i love tesla tesla's the shit i was i had owned two teslas i, I think a lot of hearts were broken right because yeah. yeah yeah and you're just like what the what the fuck are you doing man Almost, yeah like kanye is having one of those moments oh, Con too yeah right? Con it's like the same uh, thing just he needs you help know? yeah like like get these people help but yeah. it's hard to give people who they have that much power Yes. And that much money. Yes. And all these people around them that want to keep the gravy train going. A great example of <clears throat> Kanye, I think, was when he went on Pierce Morgan. And yeah. Pierce was trying to make a point or two that was actually semi-intelligent. Yeah. And he goes, I have more money than you, Pierce. Why am I going to listen to you? Like, yeah. it wasn't taking in anything no. based on that. It's It just echoes what you just said. Like, yeah. they're not going to listen to anybody. No, because they're, they're, yeah. they're unwell. They're, yeah. not, they're not able to hear. Yeah. They can't listen. And uh, there's a part of them, again, there's a parasitic aspect of them that is so loud. They're like, nay, nay, boo, boo, nah, I'm not listening. Nah, nah, nah. I'm the most powerful, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, there's no way. And people defend these people, which I think is hilarious. They, they defend it. And I'm like, I don't understand how you can defend that. And it's not like, it's not a binary issue of like, fuck those people. For yeah. me, it's just like, I'm so disappointed in these people. That's more the vibe. No, I don't hate them. I'm just really disappointed. These people and I think just media at large, it's kind of sad because this is a man that needs help and we're like sensationalizing yeah. this, you know what I'm trying to say? Yeah. This like mental illness, we're yes. sensationalizing. Oh, completely. Yeah. And people don't see it that way, yeah. you know, and Trump is the same way. Yeah. You know, uh, we just, and people just love train wrecks. So, you uh, know. The saying goes, if it bleeds, it leads. Yeah. And other people yeah. are u right. utilizing that, that person's visibility and yeah. the fact that they'll do whatever the fuck they want, it, they, they want to do and they're causing all this chaos. There are people behind the scenes that we don't see that are completely taking advantage of it. And the, and they'll they'll do whatever they can to to, to yeah. keep them doing that because that's their gravy train. See that's see if if you're talking about like kind of having compassion for people that are fucked up in that way. Yeah, it's hard for me to have compassion for them in that way. Do you get that? Uh, like, yeah, like the oh, people I know. you're referring to right there. Yeah, you know? yeah I know, yeah, I know. Well, yeah. because I mean, if you think of it in a mini world stereo in physics or in quantum physics, like that, you know, like all possibilities exist exist simultaneously. Oh, and that go we're more just, into that. We're yeah. just constantly making micro choices that mm. lead us to different outcomes. Right? Mm. It's like an infinite horizon. Right? Right? Mm. Depends on which direction you want to go to. You can end up way over there or way over here or way over there, depending on these micro decisions that you make. And so in, in that circumstance, there is a version of Donald Trump that, Trump that is actually compassionate. There wow. is a version of Elon Musk that like has a has an awakening one day, takes ketamine and fucking, you know, uh, has this awakening going like, oh, my God, I've been doing it wrong. 
This is like, this is not, this is not the best way to do things. Mm. I have the goodwill of so many people and I'm wasting it. Mm. I'm just fucking flushing it down the toilet. How can I turn this around and then make a big apology and start doing things great? We've never seen that in our lifetimes with anybody like that. Yeah. But imagine if they did that. Insane. Even if they did it for the absolute most selfish reasons. Yes. True selfishness actually is being benevolent. True selfishness is actually being benevolent. That's a deep, that's a deep concept, Reggie. Deep cuts by Reggie. Deep cuts. Um, I was gonna say though, uh, the the ego, right? We talked about like sabotage and stuff like that. I think the ego ties in a little bit to this, right? Sure, hundred percent. You mentioned having like an ego death. On yeah. Your, it's coming. The ketamine hole. The K hole. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you for the camera. Well, which camera should he do that to? <laughs> uh, I, I like that he looks at that camera. I'm like that camera is incredible. That can. <laughs> so yeah, like let's let's talk about that because. For me, like, I think we can be in my experience of living, like, you know, there were times when I was led by spirit and there was times when I was led by ego. Ego took over. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. Like when I first got in the music business, right, I got in for like, like, oh, music like heals people. And it was like really like, I, I like I worked in A&R for a while at Interscope. Yeah. And oh, I was sick. like, yeah. And I was like, I, it'd be so great to have, you know, some small part in finding, uh, helping amplify music that can help people. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I know course. how much music helped me, right? Of course. Yeah. yeah. But then... Fast forward many years of the label, I'm just fucking, I'm, I'm so in my ego and I'm just like way off track, Reggie. Yeah. Really? Seriously. Yeah. And I just started to hate myself. Yes. You know? Yes. And uh, it was like spirit led and then ego took over. So, you know, can you speak to that at all? Because obviously like your ketamine experience helped you, um, help birth and ego death, right? Something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you speak to that then? Yeah. yeah. I mean a hundred percent. I mean, you know, I, I I was, you know, we were doing Robitussin, you know, which has dextromethorphan in it, which is also a dissociative, which is what ketamine is and also what PCP is. Mm -hmm. Um but uh you take enough of it and it just erases your concept of who you are, which is, you know, a form of ego death, right? Mm -hmm. Or it is ego death. People call it ego, ego death. And um and oftentimes it's terrifying as your ego is dying because your ego wants to survive, right? It's like it's Bro. like it's like drowning. It's like oh, 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 it's like yeah. oh, I live. Oh, okay, you know, and it's trying everything, but then the the drug is just like dissolving the reference point that is your ego. And so once that's dissolved, you realize, oh shit, that I don't I don't really need like. Ego is a is a positive thing, and there's a healthy ego. And to me, you want to believe in yourself at the end you of the day, right? Yeah, you know, it's like it's going to be hard to you know use your talents in the world. We all have talents. Yeah, it's going to be course. super hard to use those talents if you don't believe in yourself. Oh, hundred percent. Right? Oh, hundred so, percent. Yeah. No, I mean it's consciousness. It's like mm -hmm. that's what ego is. Ego mm -hmm. is the awareness of yourself. So you're either going to believe a distortion, you know, that you project that again is based off of kind of a parasitic aspect of yourself. You kind of compartmentalize yourself and then you start visualizing yourself in a certain way and that starts feeding um a darker energy and, and then it that starts picks to up win. momentum yeah yep, it starts yep. to win yeah and then suddenly you're like you know captain asshole it's a fucking riptide reggie total riptide yeah yes it's yeah. like all of a sudden how boom. the fuck did i get like a football field away from shore you yeah, know what i mean exactly. which is my real self my true self totally yeah. totally but you know we need something you know but i have compassion for people who you know who fall into that because yeah everyone everyone was a baby everyone had love at mm. some point in their life you know hopefully but mm. like we we know love and um if we can get back to that and we can remember that that's that's our touchstone you know but sometimes we need to go down a path of, of you know of yeah. asshole chaos and 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 we kind of have a, a reality a reality check but you know, and then we start surrounding ourselves with people that add value to our lives instead of people that are taking energy from us, you know, and, and once you start having that conversation within yourself and then you start surrounding yourself with people that reflect the, the great aspects of who yourself you want, yeah. you want clean mirrors at least, mm. but I call the best of friends mirror plus. <laughs> You I know? love that, dude. Mirror plus. Because you get that clean yeah. reflection of who you are yeah. from other people, but they're also giving you something on top of it. Bro, my you know? friends make me feel like I can fly. It's exactly. awesome, dude. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah you fall yeah. and you're like, oh, you got me. And it's not to lean. I mean, sometimes we do need to lean on people, but, you know, you don't want to always be doing that. But we're part of an inter, an interconnected, uh, interdependent community, yeah. interdependent. not codependent. Not, not codependent, interdependent. One of the nice sayings I heard recently yeah. is... Um, have friends that want uh, more more for each other than from each other. Yes, 100%. You know what I'm saying? I mean, that was like the New York scene, the New York comedy scene. Yeah. Like, you know, we, we all came out of this little tiny club, 
And, um, you know, it's all the people that we see at Kumail, you know, it's Chelsea yeah. Peretti. It's, um, you know, uh, so many people, um, Mulaney, fucking Kroll, you know, um, Jenny Slate, all, all of these incredible comedians all in one place. And there was never any competition ever. Mm. It was mm. always just love, support, appreciation, egging each other on, inviting yeah. each other to do projects together. Um, you get a, you get like a, a leg up and you like invite three friends to be a part of it. Um, it was always collaborative and it still is to this day. I still, I just did Pete Holmes as, you know, um, a pilot, uh, for a game show that he wants to do. And, you know, he's like, can you do it? I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll do it. It's like, it doesn't really pay anything or whatever. It's like, I don't really care about that. It's like, I like Pete and Pete's a genius and like, I want to mm -hmm. work with him. And, and so that's kind of what it's about. It's about a community of people that care about each other and take care about each other and also keep each other in check when someone's being a dick, like someone mm -hmm. calls them out on it, mm -hmm. but in a compassionate way. It's like, that's why I believe like people like Elon Musk and stuff like that, or Dave Chappelle or any of these people, I, I hold compassion for them. Um, I, but I'm also, I also don't want to not be critical because I think that they are special people and they could be better and they could be yeah. adding so much. So your ego death personally, right? Mm-hmm. Can you A-B that for us? How did your view change, if you don't mind opening up a little bit, man? Like, well, how did your... Well, I mean, I, the first time I did LSD, I guess, would be a form of ego death, I suppose. So that was, like, 16, you know? And yeah, then, just then trying to get how you viewed the world before <clears throat> and after, right. I guess, you know? I don't really remember. You know what I mean? Like, well, I definitely... I, I've had ego... Well, I've had ego in the sense that with relationships and women, I definitely have... Um, I think done some damage to women, not like in a way that I've never been abusive in any way. I've just been not the best communicator and kind of leaving them hanging as to what the hell we're doing, what they are to me and all of that stuff. So there was, there was some of that and that was really out of fear. I don't know if it was so much like there was some ego because yeah, I enjoyed being in the company of these beautiful, powerful women, but, mm -hmm. um, I feel bad for not being more clear. And since then I've actually had great conversations with people I've dated and, and, and actually had great resolution and resolve with, with them. And moving forward, I, I, I feel like I'm a lot clearer, but that's kind of like the most, that's the worst of it. And I definitely, I don't know, sometimes a door guy, I'm supposed to be on the list and the door guy is like not even taking an effort to like, if I'm not on the list and he's like, I'm not checking with somebody and I'm like that indignance kind of like bums me out, you know? And like, and I, I might get a little testy and and not happy with myself but oftentimes i'll come back to the person and be and apologize so um you know that's the worst of it i think for me i, yeah. I haven't really had a too big of a problem because i think my create my connection to creativity is so strong yeah um yeah. and and i realize that if i do start to get a big ego um i'm going to start to turn that spigot off i'm going to yeah. start closing it off and that terrifies me so i'll do whatever it takes to keep that open well said. Okay, last question. We'll bring it home with this. Yeah. You're like a voracious reader, learner, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, so I'm that way too. Like I have like, you know, seven audiobooks going and multiple yeah. podcasts and stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, being that we kind of maybe share some of that in common, how do you kind of like hold both, if that makes sense? How do you like still like really have a lot of drive and ambition to kind of grow and personal develop, but also still have like grace and gratitude for the present moment. Does that make sense? Because yeah. holding both of those could be kind of a trip if you understand what I'm saying, right? A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, um, I, you know, I have aspirations and dreams about, you know, the reality that I would like to move towards. Yeah. And, and it's basically, it's more of a feeling than mm -hmm. it is necessarily a pure visual exercise and uh, like a visualization. Um, but, uh, but I appreciate, I try to appreciate the moment, you know, I try to appreciate where I'm at because, um, I have a, I, I call it a, a time traveler's perspective, which is if I project myself into the future, remembering the moment that I'm currently experiencing, I'm, I'm telling myself, like, I'm thinking about things in the past currently. Hmm. I'm like, oh man, that was, that was a great time. Uh, I really had an amazing time back then. I, I, I would love to experience um, that again, uh, or whatever. I just loved an experience. You'll put yourself in those fuzzy <clears throat> feelings from the past. Yeah. So I'll, okay. I'll project forward. So I'll be yeah. like, well, I'm enjoying this moment now as myself, who's already experienced this moment oh, nice. and recognizing how, what an extraordinary moment it is. And so in that way, I'm able to kind of enjoy the moment, yeah. appreciate it, be in it, enjoy it, but also have a gravitation to, 
a future that I want to head towards. That's beautiful. It's almost like a stable base in a way, right? Because you, you yeah. know. Yeah. yeah, 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 for sure. Versus, versus you're trying to get to this version of yourself, right, that's not here yet, which yeah. I think I get caught up doing sometimes, man, it's, which, you know. It's easy. Yeah. It's, it's totally easy. It's like, wow, I wish yeah. I was like, you know, and I still do it, but like, yeah. but I but I have a, you know, I have at least a, a tool to kind of like ground myself again. That's that's a podcast clip right there, man. <laughs> Thank you, bro. Yeah. Thank you. This was lovely. Man, my pleasure. Yeah. yeah. Um, where can people um, <clears throat> go hate on you on the internet? Can't um, wait. Is- um, <laughs> can't wait for the hate. Um, uh, uh Twitter, you know, as long as that platform lasts and um, Instagram. You're those active are, on those, yeah. those two the most? Yeah, okay. those are the only two I really mm. use. I have accounts on other things, but I don't really use them. Okay, all right. Well, go check them out, people, and keep posting on what happens after the, the James Corden show. It's going to be interesting to see <sighs> what it bolds. Yeah. Who knows? It's the works. great unknown, bro. Yes. <laughs> Such is life. <laughs> well, thank you guys for tuning in. I hope you got a lot out of this episode. Thank you, Reggie, again. My pleasure. And uh, we will see you next episode. Peace.